And I want to talk to you about borderless Europe. I'd like to talk to you about um, European Union and its place in the world. And when I started thinking about this, I started thinking about borderless Europe. And my first question in my mind is, what kind of borders are we talking about? Are we talking about physical borders, like frontiers? Or are we actually talking about, like, in my mind, far more important, much more significant borders in the mind, the cultural borders and so on and so forth? So it seems to me that physical borders, administrative borders, state frontiers, uh, they're still there. They're almost certainly less important than they were 50 years ago. They haven't disappeared. Uh, those of you who have had to travel from Schengen to non-Schengen states will, of course, immediately be pulled up short. Good heavens, I had to go into a non-Schengen. They want my passport. How extraordinary. You know, I mean, I do travel occasionally to the United Kingdom, but I feel like going back into the ice period, the United States, or other places. Um, so what I'm suggesting to you is that the European Union has created uh, a set of structures <coughs> where actually all sorts of things that did constitute more boundaries and borders are, I wouldn't say absolute, but certainly weaker. Where it seems to me uh, the problems begin is that this very term borderlessness, it's not neutral. Uh, it's value driven. Uh, it has an agenda. It's normative. It carries the implication that somehow a border is sort of undesirable. It's not explained how. It's implicit in the world. What I'm really getting at is that beyond a certain point, there is no neutrality in the way in which we use language. Uh, and borderlessness is quite clearly targeted. I think we probably all agree that borderlessness is somehow or another a good thing. But I think if you push that thought too far, it may be that in certain circumstances we actually think borders are really quite good. For example, think about an entirely borderless exercise of power. We call that totalitarianism. So be careful what you wish for. Uh, some, of the, some borders are useful, some borders are essential. What I want to do very briefly uh, is to look at some of the borders, which, you know, some of these are positive, some of these are negative. I mean, you have to, to some degree, you have to decide for, them, for yourselves and where this fits in uh, in the context of the European Union. Well, clearly, symbolic borders, they mark out a territory a cultural territory in both space and time. Um, you're here in Hungary. Hungary is full of red, white, and green flags because you know, that's the Hungarian flag. They stop the moment you cross into Austria, or Slovakia, or Romania. So here you are. There's a symbol. It's a very powerful symbol, the national flag. You may think that the flag is just a piece of cloth nailed to a piece of wood, but don't tell them. Don't tell that either to your own people or to the people of another country. On the whole, we take flags seriously, um, especially the Americans. I think it's a federal offense uh, to stamp on an American flag or something like that. I don't think we quite do this in Europe. And, you know, that's just flags. I mean, there are countless other symbols. Um, the kind of food you eat can be a symbolic act. Those of you who are not Hungarian, of course, will have realized that paprika is an absolute Hungarian symbol. In fact, of course, it's imported in another part of the universe. Uh, we really got it thanks to the Ottoman occupation. It's ours now. Um, does the name Martin Kessler mean anything to you? He wrote Darkness of Blue, one of the great novels of the 20th century. Um, and I think one of his very last writings, uh, it's very tiny, um, he, he was asked to write about 1956, the Hungarian Revolution, the anniversary was two days ago. And what he wrote was, um, it's the Hungarian symbolic presence. They are everywhere. And wherever you see red, think of paprika. That's where the Hungarians are. So, 
I don't think it's right that the red, white, and green, the red represents poverty, but who knows, maybe it does. I think it represents the pain, the suffering, the blood that we have shed. You could do a great deal with symbols. Um, Europe has a flag. Well, actually, Europe doesn't have a flag, because there is a flag, which is the European flag, which, however, is not an official flag, because when the Lisbon Treaty was signed, the Dutch and the British insisted that there shouldn't be a flag. Nevertheless, the flag is there. So symbolically, Europe does have a flag. Legally, it doesn't. Well, take your pick. Law, symbols? I have to go for symbols. Uh, I actually really do believe, in all the work I have I've done, that never underestimate the seriousness of symbols. Uh, I know the Americans frequently say, oh, that's just symbolic. Well, until you go for one of their own symbols. So don't underestimate the seriousness of symbols. Uh, they really can create a clear marking as to where one particular cultural collectivity exists and where the next one begins. Um, linguistic. Linguistic boundaries are very real. Um, those of you who are not Hungarian, I challenge you to understand one word of what goes on in this country. You might just understand sociology, you may not. Um, those of you who are Hungarian, who of course you all know English, go to Glasgow. But be parachuted into central Glasgow, and you won't understand a word, however much English you may know. Now, I grew up in Scotland, so I do understand it. Um, so, it's a very, very you know, even if you think you know a language, it doesn't fall out, you really do, uh, because of all sorts of variations within the language. So I'm suggesting to you that language is an important boundary. I'm sure you've all been to a country, those of you who are Hungarian, that didn't understand a word of what's going on. It's even worse when it's written in another script. Um, I have been to Japan and I felt like a three-year-old. I had to have everything explained to me. A very powerful boundary. Um, it's not going to go away. And I very much hope that all the languages of Europe will stay in being. Um, linguistic diversity, I think, is important. I think we approach ideas differently in different languages. There are certain parts of Hungarian that are absolutely untranslatable into English, or there are parts of English that are untranslatable into Hungarian. Um, how many of you are, are Hungarian? Um, okay, and you all know English? How would you translate the word self-indulgence into Hungarian? Think about it. Tricky, isn't it? So, here is you know, just one illustration of another boundary. Cultural boundaries, well, I've sort of half referred to this. Um, every culture establishes a certain set of propositions that it regards as right and it regards as wrong. Every culture establishes a set of propositions as to what is to be rewarded and what is punished and so on and so forth. Sometimes these are loose, sometimes these are very tight. Polygamy is quite a good illustration. Um, European cultures are not very uneasy with polygamy. Serial polygamy, that's okay, but you've got to divorce him or first first. I'm sorry, it should be polyandry, but the same difference. Um, so I'm saying that cultures are there, they do establish boundaries, they also, by the way, and they exclude necessarily, they also give you security. Within a culture, you can communicate with people. It's never perfect, but it's much easier than trying to do it cross-culturally. It's not impossible to do it cross-culturally, but actually, I think one of the most vapid experiences I ever had was trying to communicate with a Cambodian in French. He spoke French, I spoke French, I have no idea what we were talking about. <laughs> the categories were completely different. So we smiled politely at one another and said, bonjour. Russian for hours, it's, 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 you know, I have no idea. We'll probably talk about food, but that if it goes beyond. Um, historic history, oh my god, that's terrible. How on earth can you reconcile histories in this region? Try to reconcile Hungarian history, Slovak history, Romanian history, Serbian history, Austrian history, European history, deep divisions. And you know, we regard these things with great seriousness. For us, March the 15th is an extremely important historical event. 
The Austrians, strange to say, don't see it that way, because it was the beginning of the revolution against Austria. Um, I do remember taking part at a conference with an Austrian historian, and he said, oh, well, you know, we were together. Uh, you know, in Italy. Yes, I thought to myself, uh, there were certainly some Hungarian units that helped to put down the Italians. But we Hungarians, we don't talk about this. We're on the side of freedom, aren't we? Well, yes. Anyway, so what I'm saying is that there are constant clashes and conflicts in history. The best we can do is to say, let's agree to disagree. For you, that is important. For us, that is important. Um, what do we think about the 14th of July? Bastide, the 14 juillet, the most important anniversary in France. If you go to France on the 14th of July, nothing will happen. Everything is closed. It doesn't mean much to us. Um, have, you, have you all been to Rome? Right in the centre, by the Forum, there is this terrible, ghastly wedding cake of a building, the Altara della Patria. It is thoroughly up. On the other hand, this symbolises Italian statehood. There is an eternal flame, there are guards, and so on and so forth. So, from the outside, you can see other people's symbols as just bits of brick and stone and so on. From the inside, they're yours. And I'm saying this the symbolic, historic relevance is there all the time. Um, universalism against particularism. Now, this I think, is a very interesting binary opposition. Um, I think the borderlessness that I started out criticizing it is subjecting it to deconstruction um, in a totally neutral fashion. Uh, that is a universalist proposition. Somehow or other, it's a good thing not to have borders. And I'm saying, fine, as a goal, perhaps, uh, as, a, as an aspiration, but bear in mind that there are also particular values that we value as ours. That the idea of a single humanity with all values, sharing all values, I think is I think it's probably a nightmare, it's completely dystopian. But what it generally tends to mean in practice is that the stronger party imposes his or her values on the weaker and says, you must do this because this is universal. It's called colonialism, intellectual colonialism as well as the real thing. So I'm very chary of universalists uh, because I don't think they're conscious of their own agendas. They're all, they, I don't think they're conscious of the fact that, I see it as a fact, that yes, when they are saying this is a universal human value, it's actually not universal at all, but derived, let's say, from the Krishna voice in the uh, which I believe is, by the way, the universalist project. Um, so, uh, the danger that I see with universalism is that it hides the myth of social harmony. The idea that there will be a world without conflict, the lion shall lie down with the land, um, swords will be beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning, it's from the Old Testament, um, universal peace. It was their encounter, of course. I believe that this is thoroughly anti democratic. Democracy is about conflict, democracy is about solving conflict. Democracy is about argument, it's about debate, it's about disagreement. What a terrible life it would be if everybody agreed with everybody else. I can't think of a worse dystopia. So boring. Um, so I would say beware of this and then in that context, if there is something like a, a social harmony established from above, then you have the danger of a monoculture. A monoculture which gets tighter and tighter and tighter, and then it gets some kind of external, because you can never close things down entirely, and that explodes it. Now that's a particular proposition. Those of you who are interested in these things, which I've taken from the work of Grilotman, um, a Russian cultural theorist, a semanticist, I think. So he is the one who invented the term, the semiosphere, the importance of semiotics as a way of understanding what we do. Um, the book is called Cultural Explosion. It exists in Hungarian. Kultura is Robbanash. Obviously, it exists in Russian. And 
maybe even in English. No, I think it's there in French, actually. Culture et Expression, I'm not sure about it. But it's a short book, um, but I think you'll find it extremely interesting that closed systems become vulnerable discursively to some kind of uh, external influence that then causes serious difficulty. It seems to me, he was thinking about communism and the collapse of communism. He died, I think, in 1992, so he just saw the end of communism. Uh, he lived in Estonia, or what became what was always Estonia, Tartu. Um, and this book is about the collapse of the single party system and the very strong discursivity that communism sustained. A, a condemned, a very dense discursivity. And suddenly from the outside there comes, I think, but I do remember Yolotna saying that, arrives the alternative discourse of human rights, which is which gives you the possibility of standing outside the communist system and saying, wait a minute, there's an external criteria to which communism had no answer. Think of it as a computer virus. It's quite it's just an interesting metaphor which I think is, is appropriate. So um, I do think that uh, there are these facets, these hidden agendas, which people don't necessarily regard as that, which are forms of intellectual colonialism. Uh, many of these Western discourses which are said to be universal, like universal human rights, are totally hateful to the non-West. Um, I happen to agree with the proposition that uh, the death penalty is terrible. In many parts of the world they think the death penalty is really good. I mean, think of the number of people being executed daily in Iran, uh, China. Um, human life is understood differently. And actually, I mean, in Europe, it's only in my lifetime that the death penalty disappeared. It's not that long ago. But this is a deeply, deeply held European value. Uh, there are parts of the United States, of course, where they execute people. There are some states where they don't. Uh, Minnesota is one of them. So it seems to me that the proposition that we are in possession of universal ideas uh, carries really serious dangers in terms of imposing power uh, on another part of the world which doesn't want, doesn't like it. Um, let me go on now. I've got about another, I'll take about another 20 minutes because we started the little late, um, 18 I think, and talk to you about Europe itself. The European project, the idea of creating an ever closer union, well that is open and when the Founding Fathers launched this in my lifetime, I'm older than the European project, somewhat, um, the idea, nobody had any idea what this would mean. Nobody knew what an ever closer Europe was. It was left open, it was left vague. You could build things, you could construct forms of unification inside that very, very broad framework. And rich, the original process, I imagine you know this of course, is the setting up of the Cold Steel community with the explicit political objective that there will be no more war between France and Germany. If you were alive in 1945, you could just have been old enough to have lived through three. Franco-Prussian War, First World War, Second World War. So the idea of finding a way in Europe, there would be no more war, especially between France and Germany, I think, was an enormously powerful imperative. And, you know, there are very moving moments in 48, I think, that for some conference, I think it was the Hague conference, but I'm absolutely open to correction, when the German delegation arrived, it was only three years after the end of the war, and the French delegation clapped. And then there was some kind of an understanding that, okay, you know, the Germans may have done dreadful things during the Second World War, but still, you can't have a meaningful Europe without the Germans, etc., uh, etc. Et a great deal comes from that. Um, so there's this idea built in, the idea of uh, ever closer union, to which was later added unity in diversity, which then immediately raises the question, well, how much unity? How much diversity? Where's to be the border between the two? And the answer is, well, it's not very clear. We sort of work this out on a daily basis. And there's the debate, there's the argument, uh, there's the disagreement. Um, 
very difficult. It seems to me that what I've seen uh, in Europe in the last nine and a half years since I've been uh, representing Hungary there, I mean, obviously I followed my work to London, uh, but from a different perspective, uh, is that things are changing. But what I do want to do before I get on to that is to talk about the divisions, the cleavage lines in Europe. And if you think about it, there's a huge vocabulary, certainly in English, and not just in English, for division, for separation, for differentiation, for distinction, divorce, split. I'm sure there are some others. Did I write them down? Yes, uh, alterity. Um, but the one I'm using is cleavage line, which is a sociological term. Um, and it seems to me that there are several which are worth looking at. Which are, we could call borders or boundaries if you prefer. Um, the one between North and South. Northern states, Germany, the Netherlands, all a good day, Belgium and Luxembourg, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Austria. These are countries where the economy runs well. I was at a conference in Turku, in Finland, last year, I think, and the Prime Minister, Yuki Kamani, came along and said, the answer is, obey the rules. It's very interesting. I mean, first of all, he imagines that rules are obeyed in every way, identically in every European Union country. But let me give you, this is relevant, an illustration. Are you all familiar with the case of Leonardo Di Bravi? In the news, red hot, breaking news, this is this 15-year-old girl from Kosovo, Roma, whose parents entered illegally uh, into France five years ago. She's been going to school ever since. And then she was on a school trip when they went, as far as I recall, from France into Switzerland. The French police, on their return, picked her up and said, wait a minute, you are an illegal immigrant. We're going to send you back to Kosovo. Uh, so they took her in the coach, which the school party was, to the airport in Lyon and put her on a plane back to Kosovo. Now, here is, it's very interesting, the French police kept the rules. It was completely legal. On the other hand, is this fair? Is this decent? And it seems to me that keeping the rules in themselves is at best half the battle. Um, and it seems to me that those who say, keep the rules, keep the rules, don't necessarily talk about the other half of what that means. Okay, I'm, you may think that this case of this unfortunate 15-year-old, who, by the way, has been allowed back into France without her parents, completely crazy. Um, what's she going to do without her parents, 15-year-old? Um, keeping the rules on its own is not the solution, but the north-south divide is not entirely, but very largely defined in these terms. Do the South European keep, keep the rules? Yes, but not necessarily in the way in which the Finns do, and so on and so forth. Um, that has become a quite serious cleavage line within Europe. The second one I want to talk about is net contributors and net beneficiaries. Hungary is a net beneficiary. We're going to do quite well under the next uh, multi-annual financial framework, MFF in Brussels language, um, actually we're going to do surprisingly well. And let's hope that we've got the mechanisms in place to be able to get all that money out of Brussels and you have to apply, you have to do projects. Um, we will see. I mean, that's between 2014 and 2020. My problem is, when I've been watching this debate in Brussels, is that the net contributors don't really like putting in money. At the moment, in the financial perspective that's coming to an end, it's just over 1%. It's 1.03% of GDP that the countries pay, the net contributors pay. It's not very much, 1% of GDP. It's really very little if you're Germany, like the Kingdom of France. But they don't like it. And they're saying it should be diminished, it should cut back. Which means, of course, there will be less money available in structural funds, cohesion funds, and whatever. Um, 
And it may be that the next financial perspective, there will be much less money available, that the net contributors will succeed in pushing that right down. If that happens, see, it's, it's if, no more than that, it's a supposition, then I think the single market will be in trouble. Because at that point, the net beneficiaries will say, well, wait a minute, you know, I mean, our markets are inherently weaker than yours. Hungary, but not just Hungary, we are not very strong in terms of capital accumulation. We don't have that amount of capital that the United Kingdom or Germany or France have. So is it actually worth having a single market if we don't even get the structural funds and the cohesion funds? I'm simply saying this as a warning, um, although those of you who are Hungarian will know this saying about painting the devil on the wall. Um, that's not what I'm doing, I think. Um, and at that point, there will be strong arguments in the political world saying, let's forget the single market. And I want to add something here. I've got time for this. I was at a conference last month in Italy, um, and not an economist, but this, this Italian economist came up with some very, very interesting figures, which demonstrated that in terms of GDP per capita, the ranking order between 2004 and 2012 remained the same. Let me try and explain what I mean. Um, I think Austria's the highest GDP per capita, then it's probably Germany, I've forgotten the actual order. Italy is on the mean, below the, the mean, which is, let's say, 100%. Below that come all the former communist states, and Greece and Portugal. <coughs> the ranking order is, in 2004 it was, uh, Slovenia and Czech Republic, Portugal, Greece, and then come the others. Hungary, I think, is about third on the list, third or fourth, I, I don't know. The thing is, the 2012 ranking order is the same. Now that worries me because that tells me that the system of the European Union is conserving the ranking order. And I don't have to tell you that economic power and political power do have something to do with each other. Um, so there are arguments, uh, as I say, I'm not an economist, but actually an economically weak country probably does require protections. Now, we join the European Union with certain expectations, and I'm not sure all those expectations have really been fulfilled. So I suspect that there will be more movement towards protectionism, and the free market will be undercut in various, probably slightly dubious ways, simply because these economically weaker countries have to protect their, themselves somehow. With the various restrictions on freedom of land purchase is quite an interesting indicator. Uh, you can argue it in terms of patrimony, this is our sacred land, that's not going to cut much eyes. But if it's too, oh, you know, planning restrictions don't allow, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you can tell you another story from Brussels. Uh, during the Belgian presidency, uh, there was no Belgian government. Belgium worked very well with the government. 300 and how many days? 380? Uh, 500. Five, you're quite right, yes. Five, some, 500. 500 and something. 500 and something days without government. Bliss, happiness, uh, whatever you want to say. But anyway, they still did the presidency very well because they're very used to it. And I forgot, one of the ministers came along and he was asked a question and he said, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a chemist. However, I'm quite sure you can find a lawyer who will give you the answer that you want to hear. And I think that's the situation with these potential restrictions that may be imposed, protectionist restrictions, on the market. We will see. Um, large, small states, this almost speaks for itself. The European standard is the small state. We, at about 10 million, we have about eight or nine others at that sort of level. We should be the ones determining um, what Europe is about. Oh no, it's determined by the large states. The small states, well, quite apart from anything else, are not capable of forming an alliance and things will be worse in a year's time when the voting system in the council will change, which privileges, well, certainly improves the position of the large states. 
to watch that one, I think it will create tension. I don't think the small states will like being pushed about. That includes Hungary. It may be that it will create a counter coalition. Politics can do that sometimes. Um, finally, in terms of the division cleavage lines within Europe, there is a very, very deep historical cleavage line between the West and the East, the West and Centre. Uh, it goes right back to the 18th century, to some extent even before that. It's a historian's debate, second serfdom and issues of this kind. Um, if you read Voltaire, if you read Rousseau, to the East there are hairy barbarians, against which we are the hairless civilized people. Um, and indeed, that particular metaphor hasn't gone away when Hungary took over the presidency. Very shortly thereafter, there appeared a cartoon in the Süddeutsche Zeitung with a very hairy barbarian with an enormous club arriving in Brussels. And what did that hairy barbarian have written on him? Ungar, Hungary. So there you go. Um, this is a metaphor, but it's fascinating how these metaphors live on. They have extraordinary continuity. If you want to read about this, uh, Larry Wolf's book, Inventing Eastern Europe, about 1992 or thereabouts, fine piece of deconstruction. And my own experience in Brussels, as I say in the last nine and a half years, is that, well, yes, we do, we are members of the European Union, but we're still new members. Now, how long are you new? One of my colleagues remarked, a pair of shoes after nine and a half years is not new. A member state after nine and a half years is new. Is that a fair comparison? Maybe, maybe not. And to me, that sort of says, you're new members, you're sort of junior members. You're not quite there yet. Well, yeah, I mean, we were certainly told, I was involved in preparing the uh, country for the uh, presidency, you know, the presidency is the rite of passage. Once you've done that, you, you assume equal status. No, it hasn't happened. Um, in all sorts of ways, which I'm not going to detail now, uh, we are not equal member states to, let's say, countries of our size, like Portugal or Sweden or the Netherlands, it's a little bigger, Belgium is 10 million, uh, and so on and so forth. I think actually in some ways even Ireland has a higher status than we do. It's an informal ranking, it's an informal status. Nobody will ever say this. You stay down there because you're only number 17 on the list. No, 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 it doesn't work like that. Uh, but I think the reality of this distinction is still there. Uh, one, quite a, one possible illustration, in the European Parliament, uh, we tried to bring together a working group to, on, the unit, on the uniting of Europe's history. And I've taken part in this, and basically I find myself in very pleasant company with Poles, with Lithuanians, with Estonians, uh, Czechs and Slovaks occasionally. Westerners? No. Never. They never, never, never come along. You ask yourself why. So, my last topic is the one which is actually on the program, but I think I've given it a reasonable introduction. Uh, it seems to be New Horizons, the EU as global power. Well, it seems to me that everything I've said so far, that the EU is a long way from being a global power. Um, the EU, I think, any idea that the EU is or can be a global power is mistaken because the EU is not a state. It's a very, very strange, sui generis organization. Um, it's not an international organization in the classical sense. It's not intergovernmental. There are certain central uh, possibilities for legislation. That's what the Commission does. But at the same time, I don't think the EU is capable of acting in, the, in any way resembling a state. In many respects, is not even capable of acting in a unified fashion. Think about the tension between the south, the southern neighborhood, the Mediterranean, and the eastern neighborhood, the former Soviet states. France, Italy, Spain, Greece, Portugal, I think, probably some other states as well. See, the south is much more important. The Arab world, North Africa, above all the migratory pressure. We say, but yes, but you know, that doesn't mean forget about Ukraine, forget about Moldova, Georgia, and so on. And you say, we won't forget about it, but it's much more important to look south. 
And this tension can't be resolved. It's not helped by the fact that, for the most part, it's the new member states, I use that word in quotes, of course, uh, which are actually, say, Eastern partnership. Sweden is, and uh, Finland, of course, are involved. Um, what have we achieved? Very little. Uh, we may just be able to create, this is all going to happen at the Vilnius summit at the end of November, when Moldova and Ukraine and Georgia will sign the association agreement. We will see with Ukraine because they have to let Tymoshenko out. Georgia is sort of hovering on between democracy and non-democracy. It doesn't go down, doesn't play well in Brussels. The Prime Minister, the previous government is in prison, pre-trial pre detention, I'm sorry, I sleep the situation. Things of this kind. Um, so we will see. Um, what I want to do is to say that the European Union, as a process, as an institutional organization, one of the central difficulties is that it's a free globalization organization. It hasn't really come to terms with globalization, which is far more than huge, vast, enormous amounts of money going around the, the sphere. I don't even know what the field, I mean, 20 years ago, the sun, the sun was one trillion dollar, but uh, it's probably 10 times that, about 100 times, I have no idea. Nobody knows probably. But they, they can always pretend. You can always make soft data look hard by giving it a mathematical value. I'm sure you know that. Um, what I want to say here is that this is the really, really interesting dimension of globalization, which the EU simply can't cope with this. We are now living in a world of linear and non-linear processes side by side. Linear processes can be predicted, so uh, 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 2 is 4, and so on and so forth. Non-linear processes, complexity, can be anything, and the impulses can come from any direction, you simply can't prepare for them. If you want to read up about it, Talib's Black Swan is the place. It's a very, very interesting book, it came out maybe five, six years ago. Um, the Washington Consensus said the only way to run this world is through the liberalization of the market. Market will solve any, everything. Well, I think the market does not solve everything. No question that it has lifted large numbers of people out of poverty in Asia, maybe about to do something analogous in Africa, but the enrichment, the accumulation of money in China, but in a number of other states, has also meant that it has strengthening of their political power, and some of that money has been converted into military power. Think of Azerbaijan. Oil wealth, natural gas wealth, has a huge arsenal, an enormous number of weapons. Well, they say, look, 20% of our territory is occupied by Armenia, we've got Russia to the north, Iran to the south, it's a very uncomfortable place to be. And maybe I agree with that. But I don't think anybody expected that a country which is enriching itself would spend its money on military equipment. Very interesting. That's the world of unintended consequences. Migratory flows enormously increased. Demographic transformation. We, in this part of the world, are losing demographically. Western Europeans are gaining. If you go to London, you do hear Polish in Oxford Street, you do hear Hungarian in Oxford Street, Arabic in Oxford Street, Russian in Oxford Street, you might just hear English. Just conceivable. Um, in other words, a lot of our younger people are not here. So even with our birth rates, I'm talking about the entire Central European region, well below replacement rate, probably 300,000 Hungarians in various West European states. It's a new migration, it's a new diaspora. They're not that popular. Um, the Poles have a lot of problems, but then there are many of them in the UK, maybe at least half a million, possibly more because it's a shifting population. There are various parts in Britain where you can get Polish to make a and so on. This is the level at which multiculturalism is liked. Once you hear people in the streets speaking an impenetrable language, the Brits don't like it, but hey ho. Um, so, what I'm going to suggest to you in conclusion is that Precisely because the European Union is not a state, 
but it's an intergovernmental organization plus. It doesn't really have a global foreign policy. It has a global presence, but I don't think it has a policy, although we do like to talk about it. I'm a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament. We are constantly talking about it. I don't think it's actually there. I think in reality, what we're talking about is, let's say, hopes, aspirations for the future that maybe one day European Union will have a European foreign policy. So thank you for your attention.